Well, hi there, I'm Dan Jones. Welcome to Interchange. Thank you so much for joining us. Today, we're going to talk about three things, the devastation in Haiti and how much of a responsibility do Americans have to help the people there. We'll talk about why so many babies are dying in Milwaukee while sleeping in the same bed with their parents. And we'll talk about baseball superstar Mark McGuire finally admitting what we've all known for years, that he used steroids. Joining us now are Joel McNally, longtime newspaper columnist and the host of the Morning Magazine program over on AM 1290. Gerard Randall, who's a well-known job creation expert. And Denise Calloway, communications director for the Greater Milwaukee Foundation. Rick Horowitz, along with commentary at the end of the show. All right, the first thing we'll talk about is the horrible tragedy in Haiti, the worst earthquake there in hundreds of years. Tens of thousands of people are dead. President Obama sends troops, ships, and promises aid of at least $100 million. He said you can count on the United States. Do we have a moral responsibility to help a country that has a pretty long history of being unable to help itself, Joel? Well, that long history includes a, a lot of pretty aggressive actions from this country to, to keep it from helping itself. Uh, you know, uh, because of the way the, the, uh, the country of Haiti was formed, when the slaves basically overthrew their slave masters, we didn't even recognize uh, uh, the nation or the government, even though it was the second, uh, you, know, uh, you know, second oldest independent uh, you know, country in, the, in, this ha in this atmosphere to throw off colonialism. We were the first. Uh, yeah, uh, we, we supported uh, a horrible dictatorship there for, for 30 years, the Devalier's father and son. Uh, we've undermined uh, the, the uh, country in many ways. And, and uh, it, it was actually the Clinton presidency that first started uh, smoothing over uh, relations with that country and, and actually taking an interest in uh, trying to assist that country. Uh, there are some horrible things that have taken place there. You know, the deforestation and, and, and sending everyone from out of, the, out of the countryside into the cities where at one time there were companies that were going to promise them jobs, uh, you know, sewing baseballs for America and that sort of thing. Uh, m much of the conditions there we have some direct responsibility for. Worldwide, everyone has, has come together as they usually do in these kinds of horrible tragedies. There's a great opportunity now for us to, uh, you know, actually start doing something some positive things. Uh, there's a lot of hope. There was, was a lot of hope in that country for the Barack Obama administration. The fact that Hillary Clinton is our Secretary of State and, and former President Clinton has been named a special UN envoy uh, to that country. Uh, there was a feeling, uh, you know, that this was going to be a new day. And, and now this horrible tragedy has happened, uh, which of course uh, will, you know, set, set that country back once again. I, I think uh, it's a natural response and, and a special response, I think, by this country. Barack Obama acted so much quicker uh, to aid Haiti than uh, the previous president did to aid people right in our own country who were hit by tragedy, uh, the tragedy of Hurricane Katrina. So I, 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 I welcome uh, you know, a chance to improve uh, relations and actually start doing something constructive uh, in that country. Denise, let me be uh, antagonistic and somewhat cynical. What about those people in, in, in New Orleans right now that are saying, hey, it, we're not even made whole yet. Why not, why not worry about the United States before you worry about Haiti? Well, because I think this is a disaster of epic proportions. And I think we do have to worry about Haiti for two reasons. One, we really are a world leader. And when disasters like this happen, it's incumbent upon us to act like that. Secondly, I think it does a lot in terms of us really showing that we are also a leader in reacting to these human disasters that do happen. We really are a country that has the ability to come in, to mobilize quickly, and to offer aid. And just as importantly, Haiti is our neighbor in this hemisphere. We need to be able to step in and help during these times. You know, what we did and didn't do with Katrina, we can't go back and change that. But we can begin to make a real difference in what's happening in Haiti so people in Haiti don't find themselves in that kind of circumstance. And the response that's come from American citizens who want to do something to help in Haiti is just remarkable. $71 million that has been raised in just over a three-day period for organizations that are on the ground doing the best they can given the infrastructure devastation that's been seen there to really get help to people right away. I think what we should do is look at this as an example to show the, 
the, the rest of the world, how whether it's in our own country or it happens to one of our neighbors, we can move in quickly and make changes that can really help people change and save um, their own lives. You know, in, in so many words the other day, uh, Rush Limbaugh said, you know, you shouldn't, people shouldn't feel compelled to donate. We already are donating with our tax money. But you know this weekend, every single church service in America, they're going to say, donate to Haiti, donate to Haiti. Is there a point where you shouldn't feel morally obligated to do any more than we're already doing? As has already been pointed out, <clears throat> it's, all <clears throat> it's a disaster that's occurred in our own backyard. Um, there are a number of reasons why we should do uh, what we are doing for, uh, for the people of Haiti. One, because they are our neighbor. Two, I uh, firmly believe that there um, is a, um, a, a reason to do it because of uh, our own security interest in that region as well as here at home. Uh, we probably know more about Haiti than we've ever known. I've seen uh, school kids that have looked up um, the, uh, uh, the general demographics about Haiti. Uh, so they are beginning to talk about what's happening there and what the appropriate response ought to be. Uh, and even out of the mouths of babes, they're saying we need to help because it's the right thing to do. Now, have we given enough? Have we given too much? Uh, that's going to be debated for a long time because this is a short-term response that we're witnessing now. There will have to be the long-term response. It had no infrastructure to speak of. There were uh, scant responses uh, from uh, that country with regards to their own internal security, fire. Uh, they had uh, very little protections against earthquakes because they probably thought it would never happen there. And so the buildings uh, certainly uh, weren't able to withstand uh, the kind of devastation that's, uh, uh, that's been wrecked upon that country. Uh, news reporters that are going through uh, have witnessed to the fact that they can't even remove a lot of the bodies that uh, are in those collapsed buildings because they simply don't have the infrastructure uh, to do that. So we send in the military because that's the best that we can do short of uh, a, a total occupation, send in military assistance um, and hope that the missionaries and others, the volunteers with uh, organizations like the Red Cross will go in and be able to, uh, to help. All that being said, there's still the issue of do you send the money directly to the government or do you send it to an agency that you trust so that you have at least some confidence that the money will get directly to those who have need. We can't ignore the fact that there are uh, a, a far too many instances. We have a, a long experience of, of corruption in that country. And so we do have to work with organizations that we trust to ensure that food, medical uh, supplies and attention get to those people who need it. And then over the long haul, let's be honest, there will be a number of American country, uh, companies that will benefit from that devastation there. You're going to have companies like Briggs & Stratton and Generac that make small engines that will be there to, uh, uh, to supply generators in those areas to uh, help to create some power restoration. You're going to have companies like Busiris Siri that make big cranes, and a lot of those cranes will be used to help create a new infrastructure in that country that I am certain the United States is going to invest in because the president has already said he's making that commitment to do so. All right, next topic. Just in the first two weeks of the year, there have been a number of babies in Milwaukee that have died after co-sleeping with one of the parents. Just as sad and just as shocking are some folks in the community now that are saying co-sleeping is really not that bad. It's, it's a cultural thing. It's a loving thing. It's not black. It's not white. It's all, it's all races. If someone is so stupid that they can't put their baby in a crib after being told repeatedly the dangers of not doing so, I wonder, Denise, why this shouldn't be considered a crime? I mean, well, if, your, if your baby dies because you're so stupid that you can't put the baby in a crib when cribs are available for almost every single family that I, wants I think, it. I think one of the things is we're assuming that everybody's hearing the same message that we are, and that's not the case. So one of the things that the health department, I think, is doing that is really smart is taking a look at a multicultural, multi-language approach that it has to get this message out. And a lot of families for a number of different cultures, co-sleeping is something that's absolutely natural, and there's not been that 
that information that's been shared with people in a multicultural, bilingual way, now that's happening, and I think the health department deserves a lot of credit for that. They've made great efforts over the past year or two, when this, this really began to, to become an issue that we became aware of, to outreach to the community, and they're continuing that on. I, I think the that beyond the co-sleeping thing, and that's getting everybody's attention, we need to realize that the city of Milwaukee has one of the highest infant mortality rates for babies of color in the first year of their life than some third world countries. Mm -hmm. and, and this co-sleeping thing is part of what we have to address, but there are <clears throat> other health issues surrounding newborn babies in that first year of life in our communities of color that have to be addressed. We actually have more babies who die in the city of Milwaukee each year in the first year of their life than we do homicides in this city. So this is part of it, but we've got to pay attention to all of these issues that are causing babies to die in this city within the first year of their life at an alarming rate. Aren't most of the factors, can't the parents be held to blame? Uh, it's interesting, you seem to be blaming them and you seem to be attacking them as stupid. Uh, one, of the, one of the articles that promoted co-sleeping was actually published in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, written by a white woman, right. uh, saying this is, this is uh, you know, a great practice and, and uh, don't, don't rule out it in every case. I think enough of these incidents are ha have happened that uh, a, a lot more people should you know, listen up, pay attention, listen to the health department. It is amazing to me now that I've heard all these stories. Uh, when we were raising our kids, uh, I, I can't tell you how many of the things we did uh, that are now considered unsafe. There were, we had uh, bumper uh, pads around the cribs. Uh, you know, we, we did all kinds of things. Uh, we put our kids on their, on their stomach because we heard that, you know, if they threw up in the, in the course of the night, if they were on their backs, uh, you know, they could die that way. And we were always supposed to put them on their stomach. Now, my children, thank God, lived through all that. Uh, I don't think you can call people stupid because they're following practices that are common, that are considered or have been considered all right for years. Uh, and now lately they've been told, uh, you know, that's not such a good idea. I do think it does take a real strong public education program to get the word out to all kinds of people that, look, some horrible tragedies have happened as a result of this co-sleeping. And, and if I were a parent, uh, I would never consider doing it again. Um, I think there were probably some times when we had a baby in the bed with us, uh, Kit and I. Uh, and, uh, but I would certainly never do it again, and I, I would encourage you know, the, the health department and the city and, and every other level of public education to get that word out there. But uh, Denise is right. Don't assume everybody even knows that this is, this is unsafe or everybody knows that there's been these incidents uh, recently. Uh, but, but definitely work on public education, absolutely. Can there really be that many people in the Milwaukee area that still don't know it's not good to sleep in the same bed with your baby? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> County Board Chairman Lee Holloway and the CEO for Children's Hospital, Peggy Troy, <clears throat> have been working on expanding the initiative to provide more public education to uh, those parents. And we're not just talking about mothers. You have a lot of fathers that are non-custodial dads, uh, you've got their, uh, 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 the women in their lives, like their mothers, uh, their sisters that care for these infants uh, in addition to uh, the mother of the child. Uh, some of them don't have cribs. That has to be addressed. Uh, some of them have cribs and they need better education because they do uh, fall sometimes into those patterns where uh, they are sleeping with the children and, and perhaps don't think that because it happened to someone else, that it can also happen to them, that they can accidentally roll over. There is some question about whether or not some of these deaths that have occurred in the last few weeks uh, are deaths that are accidental or whether these are deaths that are intentional. And I think as more scrutiny over those situations occur, uh, that will be fleshed out. And there's nothing that you can really do about those situations where uh, there were intentional deaths, there were homicides that were involved and get wrapped up into our uh, disappointment that these children are dying as a result of, uh, of accidental co-sleeping. One of the things that um, uh, really does have to be addressed, <clears throat> excuse me, along the public information side and getting this out to a lot of these young moms that um, are learning how to be parents from their parents and those parents 
don't seem to believe that there's a, a, a big problem with having kids, uh, having especially infants, sleep with their mothers. And, uh, and that, that is going to run counter to a lot of beliefs and a lot of practice that happens in a variety of communities. It's not just the African-American or Latino community where it's occurring. And so this public relations effort, uh, public information effort, is going to require a lot of resource and a lot of dedication over a long period of time to make that uh, population that uh, will come right out of the hospitals with these newborns and uh, not see that there's a problem, get that information out to them and make sure that there's a lot of follow-up in insisting that those children uh, be, um, uh, be treated safely uh, when they arrive home. Is it the city's responsibility to get that message out? Well, I do think it's the community's responsibility, and whether it's the, the city, whether it's hospitals, whether it's other physician providers, you know, it has to be done because there's a consequence that we all pay when we have this high number of infants who die within the first year, and a good number of those are dying because of co-sleeping arrangements. Yeah, so it's a public, it, it, it is, public it is, health It problem. is a public health issue, yeah. and for that, I think all of us have a responsibility. The city has a responsibility. Healthcare providers have a responsibility. We have a responsibility as neighbors when we're talking to young moms to talk to them about these, about these issues, because I do think that it is gonna take a concerted effort over a period of time to do that. Gerard's absolutely right. We, we have some of these young women and young men who were raised by teenage moms themselves. So there isn't that, that, that set of parenting skills that most of us acquire through our own efforts or through our own parents. That, that There's a whole generation of young people who don't have that. And it turns it, out some of the things we acquire from our parents aren't really that safe. Aren't really that safe. Right, that's so, right. So, you know, uh, I, yeah. Yeah, I think we, we do have a responsibility. It's a public health crisis in some ways when we take a look at the number of, of children of color who die before the first year of their birth. We have, if we don't step in and do this, we're not fulfilling, I think, our responsibility as citizens and certainly as a community. All right, shifting gears. How about the tearful Mark McGuire finally admitting and apologizing to the world for using steroids when he set all his baseball records? He didn't deserve all the adulation when he was a player, and he certainly doesn't deserve any now just because he's going to be a coach. And, Joel, I, I've, li I've always liked your approach on this about how, you know, so much of the blame does fall on baseball because baseball turned a blind eye to this thing for a long time. Oh. Now they're doing a good job, but for a long time they didn't. And, and particularly in, uh, involving Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa. I mean, that, that home run derby between the right. two of them saved baseball after, <laughs> after the strike uh, that wiped out the World Series uh, and, and everyone was sour on baseball. That home run derby between those two sluggers uh, you know, gave them life again. Uh, and and <laughs> I know Bud Selig denies it up and down that they had a clue, uh, but I there had to be people in those locker rooms, there had to be people uh, close to the players and close to baseball that, that recognized this as a growing problem. Uh, I, I, at the same time, <laughs> I always end up defending the players a little bit. I think there were a whole lot of, of athletes who were sucked into that process because others were doing it and they for their own livelihood they felt that they in order to compete with other players they had to build them up themselves up the same way uh, and and you're absolutely right it was there's a plenty of guilt to go around but in some cases I think athletes actually hurt themselves uh, hurt their long-term health and maybe short-term health uh, at the same time uh, by being drawn into this. Um, and, and it might not have been responsible for Mark McGuire hitting all those home runs. I mean, if you hit a home run you know, out of the ballpark or you hit it across the street out of the ballpark, what difference does it make? It's out of the ballpark. Uh, and, and people like Mark McGuire, people like Barry Bonds, were, were good home run hitters before. Uh, Barry Bonds was a great all-around player before the steroid era. He probably was having a Hall of Fame career you know, before the steroid era and before he might have gotten sucked into it. And we don't even know for sure how much he was into it uh, because there's been lots of accusations and absolutely no evidence regarding him. Mm -hmm. In the case of Mark McGuire, he's admitted it at this time, but like it's seen you say, most people thought that was involved anyway. But Denise, you know Barry Bonds will end up admitting it. 
Uh, oh, Sammy yeah. Sosa will end up admitting it. I, I just think these confessions that come years after, when quite frankly, some of the young people who are fans of baseball now don't have a clue about who these guys are. I mean, I think it's a little cheap. Um, you know, I think if you and he certainly had opportunities when he appeared before Congress to to confess then, but he said he didn't know we had immunity. So, you know, I, I think it's a little cheap and I, I don't think it's that sincere. And I, I think it does really in some ways continue to hurt baseball and to cause, you know, a deterioration of fan confidence and and these numbers that people even continue to put up to this day. So, um, you know, my feeling is if you're not going to admit that, that you did it when you had the opportunities to do so, it's a little cheap and cheesy to do it. And now. Has baseball recovered from this? No. In fact, it's probably complicated uh, the commissioner's uh, efforts to try to present uh, the face of a clean baseball uh, versus what we were experiencing back in the 90s and the early 2000s. Um, and for this reason, yes, cheesy, cheap apologies, no credibility to them. Um, so many believe that he wouldn't even be making the apology if he didn't want to go back and, and become the, uh, uh, the, pit, uh, the batting coach for St. Louis. And uh, they probably told him, look, we don't want the distraction of having everyone ask whether or not you use steroids and you got to get this out of the way before spring training so that we can move on. Uh, and if you're going to be a part of this organization, uh, this is one of the ways in which you can address that. So uh, that only adds to uh, a lot of the disbelief that uh, this was, in fact, a sincere apology. He's probably just admitting uh, what many had suspected for a long time. Anyhow, I also took a look uh, at some of the reports around the voting that's taken place over the last several years regarding his entry into the Hall of Fame. And it doesn't look like he was anywhere close to getting the number of votes that he needed in order to gain entry. And this certainly won't help him with that. I mean, it, um, uh, his record notwithstanding, I do think that people will still have questions about whether or not this is the kind of person you want in. And if they let him in, certainly after this, then at w without an asterisk uh, in addition, uh, then that opens the door to all those others that are hanging out there like Sosa, like well, Barry Rose. Bonds, or Pete, <laughs> Pete Rose. Rose who did who did nothing to uh, in terms of taking drugs to enhance his performance. You know, but it if was you're the gonna, integrity of the game. If, if it goes back to the integrity of the game, then I, I guess my question would be, how can you have someone to be the hitting coach now for right. St. Louis who's admitted that he used steroids to enhance his performance? He's a pretty good hitter. What I've always Before wondered. After. <laughs> well, but what I really always wondered, I mean, and we, knew, we haven't mentioned Roger Clemens yet, um, if you're a if you're a home run hitter and you're going up against a pitcher who's on it's steroids, yeah. <laughs> and you're on steroids, does that does that cancel it out then? And so you know all your records are okay against those pitchers. No, I but, don't know. but you know baseball can a absolutely take leadership in this because it's not just in baseball; it's in football. We're going to see lots of revelations there. I have absolutely no doubt that in uh, endurance sports like basketball, you're going to see the same thing crop up with all these designer drugs that are out there uh, and the ability to mask when they test, this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to these discussions and who should and who shouldn't be given accolades for their performance. Well, and I think it's because as fans, we want to see the big numbers. Uh, we want to see that. And so right. players do whatever they have to do in whatever sport it is to be able to accomplish those goals. All right, you know, sometimes it's big muscles that get you noticed. Sometimes it's a prominent job. Rick Horowitz was doing the noticing on a flight to Washington earlier this week, but let him tell you about it. Rick. I'm sitting in 9B. The congressman is five rows up and across the aisle in 4C. We're headed for the nation's capital, and not long after we're airborne, they tell us we're free to use our approved electronic devices. So I get my laptop out, and uh, up in 4C, meanwhile, I notice the congressman is reading a Kindle. I say it's a Kindle. Maybe it's a different brand from uh, five rows away. I can't be sure. But it's definitely an electronic reader, and he's definitely reading electronically. Maybe he's checking out some brand new plan to balance the budget, rescue the health care system, keep us safe from terrorists, and lose those unsightly extra pounds, all without raising anyone's taxes. <laughs> read on, Congressman, read on. 
Anyway, the time goes by and we're getting closer to Washington and then they make the announcement that it's time to turn off all those electronic devices. If it's a watch or a pacemaker or an electric oxygen machine, the pilot says, that's fine. Otherwise, you have to turn it off. Sounds reasonable. That's to keep the devices from possibly interfering with the plane's navigation system during takeoffs and landings. So I shut down my laptop and I look up ahead at 4C and the congressman is still reading his Kindle. I figure he's just finishing up the page he's on and he'll be shutting it down any minute now. But the minutes pass and uh, so do the flight attendants right past his seat and nobody seems to say anything to him about it. Back in 9B, I'm wondering, is there a special exemption for Kindles? Is there a special exemption for congressmen? Shouldn't they have to play by the same rules the rest of us do, particularly when our safety's involved? You'd think the congressman would want to be safe too, especially with all the years he spent building up seniority. Anyway, we're in our final descent now, and he's still reading his Kindle. And we touch down, safely, thank goodness, and only then does he finally stow the thing. I'm annoyed, definitely annoyed. Meanwhile, they give the rest of us, you know, the ones who follow the rules, permission to check our cell phones while we taxi to the gate. So I reach into my pocket for my Blackberry, which is already on, which has apparently been on for the entire flight. So who's feeling guilty now? Thank you, Rick, and thank you so much for watching. Stay warm. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. You are the spot.